welcome to uh, today's uh, Walk Listen Cafe. Uh, we've got a bit of a special edition uh, this time around because we are meeting last year's winner, uh, winners of the Soundwalk September Awards. And uh, you might be aware that last year we had one winner and three honorable mentions, and all of them uh, are going to show their work uh, and talk about uh, and talk about it and uh, talk about their ideas and maybe processes and uh, the large crowd that is present. All of you, you can ask questions whenever you feel like it. Uh, if you really must, you can jump in uh, or you can put your questions or remarks in the chat uh, or wait till everyone has presented and then throw in your questions afterwards. Um, each of the four speakers will get 10 to 15 minutes, so it will take us to about an hour. I might have a few questions, and then as I said, you're welcome to join the discussion. Uh, and well, we'll see how far we go, but after between probably an hour and a half or at most two hours, uh, we'll be done, but maybe uh, an hour and a half will uh, uh, be, oh, two Andrew Hunts will be enough to uh, uh, to keep us entertained. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, mention the speakers in reverse order. So I'm starting with the person who will speak last. Uh, so, uh, and that will be uh, 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 Laura Mitchison, who was last year's winner, uh, and who was a winner for an unprecedented second time, because she also won in, I believe it was 2020, um, with another piece of hers. And this year, or last year, I should say, 2022, she won with a piece that's called Are You a Ghost Hunter? Uh, Laura is co-founder of On The Record, uh, which co-produces arts and heritage projects with groups who are otherwise underrepresented in culture. They specialize, uh, that is, uh, On The Record, in oral history, co-production, and creative media. And Laura's work centers, uh, in, that is her submission, the winning piece from last year, centers on St. Mary's Old Church, which is London's only surviving Elizabethan churchyard, where the tombstone inscriptions have been lost uh, to weather and time. And uh, her work, the uh, self-directed audio trail, pieces together uh, fragments of story and history. So that's Laura. Then we have uh, Joe Scott, uh, who is a media artist and researcher based in Salford, so not London for a change. Um, her soundwalk, uh, uh, her work, which was a soundwalk uh, through central Manchester, um, which is called Wonders in a Wild Smart City, explores the networked digital processes that are happening all around us in new or smart cities. And this is through technologies which uh, are embedded into the city itself. Uh, into the urban environment, uh, but which uh, often uh, may remain, and more so ever than before, remain invisible to us. We don't know that they exist, but they do monitor us. Then we have uh, Tony Onuchukwu, uh, who is a multidisciplinary artist, sound designer, musician, and also former doctor, uh, and who, whose current practice <laughs> Uh, explores counterculture, memory, and innovation. And in his um, uh, submission, uh, his uh, piece for which he received an honorable mention last year, a protagonist travels around Berlin Gap in East Sussex, where the experience should be seen as an inner journey, which mirrors the repeated journeys the protagonist has taken in the area. Like a lost traveler within her practice, she is constantly looping back on herself repeating, returning, and rediscovering. And then our first speaker is going to be Eleanor Rycroft, uh, who is a historian of walking and theater. And in her piece, Night Walk, uh, she documents a group of 17 women, primarily women of color, who walked a significant area in Bristol, uh, and it was or is significant for histories of gender, sexuality, and race in the city. While women, uh, in relation to the piece and the place, are largely, largely debarred from walking at night, uh, these women took a route that is historically associated with sex work, and so were connected to a lineage of night walking women. Uh, so these are our four speakers today, and uh, I would like to start then to invite Eleanor to uh, talk about her work. 
Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to find my PowerPoint. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, fabulous. Thank you so much. It's a complete honour to be here talking to you tonight. Thank you so much to Walk, Listen, Create and to the Sound Walk September judges. Um, as is my want, it will probably be quite an academic paper rather than a, a sound-based processy type paper. But I wanted to give you some sense of the historical background belying the walk that we did. Um, so Nightwalk came out of an interdisciplinary collaboration between historians, public health experts, performers and walking activists led by the University of Bristol. The overarching project was called Walking and Recreation. It was founded in the belief that during the 1600s and 1700s or the early modern period, walking was seen as a form of recreation in that it was a source of leisure and good health but it was also a form of recreation. The early moderns had a far more profound sense of recreation as a form of renewal or regeneration, as Elaine McKay shows us. By participating in recreational activities, people undergo something of a transformation. People undergo a physical, mental or spiritual renewal, which not only incorporates a reconstitution of health, but also offers opportunities to regenerate or recreate a sense of themselves as individual or unique personalities. Recreation in an early modern sense then concerns activities capacity, McKay writes, to create again or build upon what already existed in a physical or psychological context. And recreation is both participation in an enjoyable activity and a regenerative process for mind and body. Thus, recreation consisted, she writes, of two elements, one an activity, the other the regeneration that such an activity would bring. What I found in my historical research, however, is that the conferral of the recreative benefits of walking diverges along lines of gender, class, age, religion, race and ethnicity. Walking is not simply a case of individual health, therefore, but points us towards wider cultural and ethical patterns. Typically, the aims of men's walking when compared to women's, for example, are altogether loftier. For men, homosocial walking frequently serves the ends of male supremacy by serving the structures of elite masculinity. So in Delectable Demands and Pleasant Questions, Hortensio Landi asks, where is the best walk that can be found? The answer, the walking place that is furnished with wise men. What is being recreated through the activity of men walking together are the mobilities that underpin patriarchy. For Landy, walking is not about action or environment, but company. He posits ambulation as an inherently homosocial event. He's not alone in terms of early modern writing. Walking recurs as a place where well-ordered conversations between men can take place, through which the communal bonds of masculinity are enacted and perpetuated. Early modern writers' promotion of this ideal resonates with another meaning of recreation which McKay identifies. Underneath pleasure, recreation has a function which is related to physical and mental health and the ways in which we form our individual personalities, organise society and form a collective national consciousness. It is a constant regeneration of individual and collective identities. It is how we view ourselves and project to others that sense of identity on both a one-to-one -one basis and a more general level. Across this gendered pedestrian line, the semantic vacillation between recreate and recreate demonstrates the limits of the types of identities which walking is able to create. While elite men often have positive attributes associated with their walking, the picture is different for early modern women. Women's walking abroad is likely to be equated with women's gadding about. The terminology recreates feminine agency as sexual availability or dishonesty. Unchaperoned walking women are almost by early modern definition wayward. Across manifold gender conduct manuals from the period, we see a clamping down on women's mobility and their increasing confinement to the home during the 16th and 17th century. And what particularly interested me 
was a shift that occurred around the concept of night walking at the time. So Paul Griffiths suggests that the label of night walking communicated several anxieties, all of which were of essential concern to the ordering of early modern society. They included the regulation of sexuality, the policing of women, the ordering of time, and specific disorders that were associated with darkness and the fall of night. Griffiths claims that a quickly changing situation around the attribution of night walking can be dated to the first half of the 17th century. So what we have is during the 16th century, night walkers are typically seen to be criminal or vagrant men. And then increasingly from the beginning of the 17th century, especially in London, this label starts to become applied to women. And the ultimate end point of this shift is an almost total elision between the label night walker and sex workers, which is in place by about the 18th century at least. As Griffiths identifies, the shift serves to sexually and socially control women. In London, night walkers were commonly imagined as lewd women, enticers of youth and other people to lewdness in the evening. Decker's Inquisitor in Lantern and Candlelight asks questions of women walking late. Where have you been so late? Are you married? Where's your husband? Where lie you? So the censure of night walking becomes another way in which women's mobility is surveilled, scrutinised, condemned and contained. My concern with the project Walking and Recreation then was not only to relocate this very useful sense of early modern walking and its transformative potential on collective identities and bring that into our present moment, but to do so in a way which disrupted this privileging of the male historical walker um, and in ways which exposed how pedestrian discourses and practices have and continue to oppress women. Though onto the walk itself, night walk took place on July 23rd at midnight the witching hour, of course. We aim to galvanise a community of women walkers who would occupy space from which they had been excluded. Through the practice of collective walking, we hope to embody our defiance of the vetoes placed upon our ability to move through the world freely. The walk was led alongside Bristol Stepping Sisters, who are all women of colour, and the spaces we explored were the night time, the woods, and significantly, significantly for the city of Bristol, Clifton Downs. The Downs were given by an Act of Parliament of 1861 to all Bristolians forever hereafter open and unenclosed. That's the language of the Act. We began at a toilet on Durdham Downs, which was a gay and lesbian cruising spot in the 1930s. We travelled down Ladies Mile, which was associated with respectable white promenaders by day and sex workers by night, and that those records go back to about 1884. We went through some woods. We went along the side of the Avon Gorge, uh, along an area called Sea Wall, via an unexpected dogging site, and across the Downs themselves, which are notoriously connected with sexual attacks on women. Unfortunately, the latest of this was only in May of this year. While we walked, Alice Boyd created a soundscape through walking interviews. Our intention as the judges thankfully and astutely realised was to make this soundscape as transparent and as unedited as possible. We wanted it to feel like you were on the walk with the women. People don't know what it sounds like for 17 women to go walking through the woods at midnight. And we wanted our listeners to join us in that experience as far as possible via the soundscape. Um, if I've got time, I might just play this. Baba, can you give me a thumbs up if um, you can hear it? How are you feeling now? You're actually on the walk. I was a bit apprehensive about the thought, oh God, I'm walking through the woods at the best of times. Let alone at night. Yeah, it's okay, it's different. It's an experience. It is exciting, you know, seeing the downs in a different light, i.e. no light. Oh. That stopped. <laughs> you know, what your eyes go to to the light, so you look at things that you wouldn't necessarily look at during the day. I feel a bit, um, a little bit vigilant, but I also feel nice because <laughs> the air is really cool and it feels refreshing to be out. 
think if I was wasn't a woman, I'd, I'd do night walks more often because I do like the nights. But I love walking. I mean, it's something I wish everybody could do and not just for kind of... From A to B, that it wasn't something that sometimes feels quite novel for some people, just because they can't they can't find the time or they don't have the access. I think it's great, but I always like when I go and walk. I like the atmosphere with the ladies and the way everybody are. You, you, you drop in and you talk to different people about different things. It's nice to be, um, yeah, walking with other people. And like at a time of day that I would never really be out at this time walking. Um, so I, I won't play another section, but there, there was a very telling part of, of the soundscape where um, we asked the women, would you do a night walk again? And every single woman said yes. And then the next question was, would you do a night walk alone? And every single woman said no, which I thought was, was a very telling moment in terms of their experience. When I'm asked by the public engagement team at Bristol what the end point looks like to this research, I say that I'd like to live in a world in which women are free to leave the boundaries of their homes, wearing what they want, moving how they wish, at any time of day or night, and go for a walk. This still seems like an insurmountable ask, as the tragic recent deaths of Sarah Everard, Sabina Nessa and Zara Elena show us, lest we forget the hashtag on Twitter for the public outrage around Everard's murder became hashtag she was walking home. I know that this enormous social and historical issue isn't going to be solved by a single night walk in Bristol, but through this walk and the soundscape we produced, we started to think at least about what the world looks like and what it sounds like and what it feels like when you walk in a way from which you were disallowed, allowing the recreational act of walking to also be an act of recreation, progressing in order to progress. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, that is really very interesting. Um, I have a kind of curiosity in relation to uh, specifically the places uh, that you walk through. Uh, did you identify any physical legacies to the histories uh, that these places were um, uh, are described through in the way that you were describing them uh, in, with the stories going back to the 16th, 17th century? Did you see physical legacies of that? So the toilet still exists. Um, it, it was the 19 kind of 30s toilet. Um, and there are actually medieval boundary stones uh, around that area, which are marking kind of li the limits and boundaries of Bristol. But because it was dark, we couldn't see them. Um, so other than not really, but it's, it's that feeling sometimes, especially when you're walking through woods, when you, when you realise that you've been walking somewhere that that hundreds, thousands, millions of people have walked before, and you're retreading those steps. Um, but not particularly 16th and 17th century markers. Yeah, yeah. or, or that um, you, I, you experienced some of these places that had this history noticeably different from other places, not because you knew of these stories, but because they created a different perspective by how they presented themselves to you, maybe like that? Um, I think the, I think the perspective that was different was about walking at night. And, and one of the really key things about that was that because we felt safe, we weren't just trying to get out of the situation of walking. We were able to take in our surroundings. We were able to look at the skyline of, of Bristol. We were able to look at what a bush looks like at midnight in a wood. Um, rather than just supposing that there is something in the bush that's going to come and get us. So it, it produced lots of new perspectives because we were able to perceive the environment through safety, through through a safe lens, um, which we're not normally. In terms of that kind of, the other thing that, sorry, that I've kind of, the way in which I envision it, in terms of the time scape of it, is that what we were doing was creating a kind of wormhole and that we were a tunneling or kind of time traveling and connecting ourselves um, through, yeah, to this lineage of night walking women, but all the way back to the Ice Age. You know, these are the spaces that we are looking at. These are the, um, but, but in a new light, I suppose. 
are you uh, or are you pursuing or are you aware of any initiatives that are pursuing similar activities maybe in Bristol as well or in other places? I'd love to do more night walks um, with more marginalized groups. Um, so possibly working with a, a charity called Bristol Women's Voice, working, uh, walking with a group of Somali women, uh, walking with a group of LGBTQ plus um, women, um, and uh, and even just thinking about it, we had a conversation about it the other day. I can't I can't emphasise enough how actually scary it is <laughs> um in the contemplation of it and you think are we really going to walk through that area uh, that's really dense that's really remote are we going shall we do it um and the the day before we did the night walk i felt so responsible and fearful um uh, about what i was the situation i was putting all these women into um and of course it was fine but of course that's the thing about women walking in safety it's fine until it isn't and that's the kind of tight tight rope that you're sometimes walking as a woman yeah yeah thanks um thank you very much uh yeah i saw there were a few comments in the chat uh, but not really questions so i'll let everyone peruse these comments uh themselves uh, or if you want to jump in jennifer or joe uh, uh, as a response to this you're very welcome um and uh, we have to uh, wait for Joe's presentation if she wants to comment on this presentation, because first we're going to move to Tony. Tony. Hey, how are you doing? <clears throat> Can I just share my screen? Can you see that? Great. Perfect. Okay, so this is the session I worked in to create Berlin Gap. Um, it's a logic session, as, as you can see. Um, basically, um, to start with, Berlin Gap is a, is a cliffy landscape, a hilly landscape in Eastbourne. Um, it's popular with walkers, families, and it's quite eerie um, and quite negatively, it's a site of suicide as well. So I kind of wanted to capture that into this, in this um, production, in this soundscape. Um, to begin, I'd like to reference another piece which is pivotal in the making of this soundscape. Um, NTS Radio's Time Is Away, um, Derek Jarman, um, Prospect Cottage, 1989, is a soundscape um, slash audio essay which employs e extracts of Jarman's memoir, Modern Nature, field recordings made on site and haunting musical melodies from a variety of sources. I found this ode to Prospect Cottage and Derek Yarman's unique relationship to landscape arresting and impactful in my production of Burning Gap. His property exists on a complex terrain some people might consider an edge land, a kind of forgotten zone between stratified terrains of city, town and countryside. Uh, behind Yarman's cottage is Dungeness Power Station, a site of capitalist production which exists in contrast to the tranquil heaven of the garden he describes. I'm interested in the liminality of edge lands as non-places and conversely how Yarman's cottage has become kind of preserved memorial in the tourist destination in the contemporary, an emblem of death that keeps living. This relationship between, between timelines, the living and the dead, is mentioned by Yarman in his memoir. I walk in this garden holding the hands of dead friends, mirroring the phrase at the start of the piece of Berlin Gap. I walk at Berlin Gap, holding the hands of lost souls. Let me know if you can hear this. It appears not. Okay. No worries. <laughs> so, um, let me let me just see some quickly. Okay, yeah. I seek to produce this kind of timeless sensation in my work. I'm interested in creating a soundscape for the degree show, um, which was Isabella's degree show. Isabella is a pr protagonist in this, in this uh, soundscape, including a soundscape which invites the viewer to suspend time and urgency to allow space for reflection. 
Isabella recording all the spoken word parts and made field recordings of Burning Gap, which I included. The music was carefully curated by me. The first piece was a song called House by Ulla Strauss, which begins with uh, wind chimes and it's swirling and it's, and it's quite involving. It's very immersive. All the songs I chose were very immersive soundscapes, which kind of chose to, which I chose to drive the narrative forward. Um, the second piece was a classical piece by a member of Siegel Ross, um, which, which was quite long in hindsight, and I felt I should have just shortened it a bit, but um, I feel it worked. And the third piece was a piece by The Caretaker, um, which kind of has an eroding kind of uh, eroding kind of uh, dilapidated feel, which kind of brings the piece to an end. Um, this, this piece was presented in Goldsmiths University as part of Isabella's Degree Show, um, a constructed slash living brass flora and fauna um, was constructed and this piece played over speakers. Um, my, it was my, my aim to, um, to hope that this piece would have a transformative, calming and reflective effect on the viewer allowing them to encounter the sensation of being within nature in an unexpected way, which provokes a new understanding of space and opens them up to unpredictable and emotional experiences. Um, just gonna show some pictures here of Berlin Gap, as it is now, as it was then. I'm not sure who took these pictures, but there you go. And yeah, this is a picture taken on Berlin Gap itself, right at the edge. Um, I think it was a film camera, which captures captures it beautifully with the kind of colours there, the washed out colours there. Um, there's another photo as well. Beachy Head Lighthouse there, Berlin Gap. So this whole section is Berlin Gap here. And you can walk around there. And I urge anyone who hasn't been there to, to um, go and check it out because it's, it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful place. Um, I went there last time two years ago in the summer and it's, it's breathtaking. I uh, went there with a friend. Um, beautiful place. So definitely go check it out if you can. Shame I can't play this, but <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Um, you, you, Tony, you don't have another way of playing a little clip of the uh, audio? You don't have an MP3 file that's uh, hiding somewhere in your computer, perhaps? Yeah, I should do one second. I mean, we all, of course, despise the low quality that MP3 brings to the world, but... Mm. Yeah. Don't think I actually do. I think I'm gonna leave everyone to just go and listen to it on their um, on their spare time. Now we have to. <laughs> Thanks. We definitely have to now. Yeah. <laughs> now, one question I have is uh, the following: the piece Berlin Gap. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I also think it's a very uh, as with Laura's comment. Uh, I, I think it's also a very emo em emotive. A piece that uh, you put together, and that's also what my question is about your uh, your uh, well sound walk or your audio piece is really a kind of interpretation of your protagonist's experience while visiting Berlin Gap. Uh, 
uh, is this typical for the work that you do uh, or are there or are you also working on pieces or are you intending to work on pieces where you yourself perhaps are the protagonist uh, with an exposition of your ideas and feelings and thoughts or is it more that you cooperate and interpret interpret other people's um, uh, experiences yeah this is the first piece i've done where i've I've taken on the, the the task of interpreting someone's experience, like in a full length piece as, such as this, um, like in a hands on way. She's given me all the files. I layer them with sound. I layer them with music. Um, my pieces, my work generally is like that. Yes, I my my day job. I work as an audio engineer for a podcast company, and also in my spare time, I do. You know, I do audio pieces, so a lot of the work is for clients, is for other people. So a lot of that is to is telling the stories of other people and putting my take, on, my spin on it, um, with my own idiosyncrasies. You know, laid on top. So it's also always um, a form of evolving collaboration. My work, um, and I, I do love that. Um, I feel that makes makes it a great, I feel I'm, I'm quite excited by that um, aspect of working with other people, telling other people's stories. And it does give me a sense of purpose and a sense of um, in the future, wanting to tell my story um, with that springboard of having to, to, to talk, having told other people. So um, yeah, I very much enjoy it, telling, telling people's stories, yeah. Uh, and so if you say your day job is with a, a podcasting company, do you find that uh, you are able to uh, uh, address your artistic itch within your paid work? Or would you say that the example of Berlin Gap is uh, um, well, exemplary for uh, the, the release valve of your artistic interest that you cannot find in the professional work that you do? Or am I totally wrong? That's how okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great um, great channel to you know to express my um, artistic endeavors through this to this form, and I I really um, appreciate Soundwalk for giving that opportunity. I also also do music as well, which is also an outlet. Um, make um, like experimental pop and kind of jazz electronic stuff. So that's a big outlet as well. And I find the two are kind of um, contrasting this kind of work as experimental um, sound pieces, audio, immersive pieces, and the music, and I feel like they're quite different if you listen to my music, but also quite the same as well. So um, it's a great, it's a great thing to to be to be part of. Yeah. Yes. To release your creative urge. Now, then, if you uh, also construct or create experimental. Uh, Pop, pop, experimental pop, is that what I, no? Uh, you must have a Spotify uh, page. So what's your Spotify URL? I do, I do. Um, let's go to, uh, I'll show you my website first of all, uh, you got some. That's, that's my website, uh, that's music website. Um, yeah, you can read that. Got an Instagram, Apple Music, Spotify. So the, the, oh, the artist's name is New Gosson. That's it. Um, you can check it out but that's not you or is it you yeah that's me yeah new garçon new ah garçon. that's your stage name Ooh. that's the stage name yeah new garçon so this is you we're looking at you yeah nice yeah uh okay uh are you can you new garçon ah yeah you put it in ah great jennifer is uh, uh ahead of me very good jennifer yeah she she's um, a fan i think <laughs> 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 she is your fan. Um, okay, well, th thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to check it out. And, uh, uh, well, I think everyone should check it out. Um, uh, maybe Robin, you had a, a, a comment that maybe uh, uh, warrants sharing about the caretaker. Can you say a little bit about this? Uh, can you hear me all right? I'm not sure if I'm coming through. Yeah, well, yep. loud and clear. Oh. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, that's it. Um, no, just uh, you mentioned the caretaker, and um, 
I had this idea years ago for doing something based on um, that row of cottages in the photograph. Apparently they have to keep demolishing them one by one over mm. the years because they keep literally the, the coastal path recedes so badly that they keep sort of, it's either demolish them or they're going to tumble off the cliff. And when you mentioned the caretaker, I thought, you know, so much of his work is about erosion. Um, I mean, in, more metaphorically so obviously i haven't heard the piece yet but i'm just wondering I, th I thought it was interesting given that sort of coastal erosion is such a serious issue at berlin gap and then you're talking about the use of the caretaker's work and i'm wondering sort of how much the changing nature of the place affected the sort of very changeable nature of the place affected the soundscape that's not really a formed question but that's just what i'm thinking at the moment yeah i totally understand where you where you get it where you go um where you're going with that question um i feel like yes as you said the caretaker is very um is very on erosion memory decay um which is why i wanted to add add him into this piece the piece in question is actually Extra Patience and it's After Sebald, which is um, the album where oh, wonderful. The album, yeah. everything, mm. everything's on the point of decline, um, which is mm. what we're talking about. He made that um, to explore um, Alzheimer's, dementia and memory, all of the mm. tracks that eroded, like worn out, played on vinyl, but just, just destroyed to a, to mm, a point it's a lovely record, yeah. no return. Yeah. And it's just very emotional as well. It's really, really emotional uh, music and it just mirrored it perfectly. When I when I dropped the music on the on the um, timeline of the session, it was just it just perfect. So it was that's right. When it happens, yeah. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Out of then curiosity, um, uh, if you put or when you put uh, such an emphasis emphasis on uh, the decline of uh, parts of Berlin Gap uh, uh, as part of your piece. Do you see uh, that we are going through through societal decline, or so is this exemplary for the times we live in, in your opinion, or are we uh, uh, maybe struggling but improving uh, society as a whole, or maybe British society or European society, or how do you how do you see this? That's a big question. Um, I mean, there's sometimes when I just despair in society and just feel like we are going downhill, um, and you know, but I. There's things like this which give me hope, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it, it's a two 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 horse race. You know, one one time we can be we can be going down downhill and things like that. But there's there's things in life to to look forward to, to to look to look up to, to look forward to. And I feel like community, um, creating art, creating music, um, fellowshipping with like minded people. Um, such as we are doing today can kind of lift our spirits and give us hope for the future. And I just feel like we should continue doing that and hope it doesn't decline. Yeah, well, yeah, if you can release your creative urge then, yeah, and, and perceive, per, pursue a, a personal growth, um, then at least on a personal level, um, you're able to uh, well, grow and benefit. But that doesn't indeed necessarily also mean that society as a whole uh, uh, is able to go through the same positive curve. Um, but yeah, I, I get you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, uh, the, well, sure, we're going to have a, more of a chat uh, afterwards. Um, but I want to move to um, Joe. Joe, go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Babak. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kurt, and to all of the Wartless and Create team um, and to the Sam Walk September judges uh, for all of this, so facilitating this event and also for the awards um, organisation as well. So yeah, hello everybody. Um, I'm Jo Scott. I'm an artist researcher currently based in Salford in the UK. I'm going to share my screen and kind of dip between a few sources and things, so hopefully that will work. Um, but uh, there's only one bit of sound. We'll see how that goes. Um, so the way I describe myself, I suppose, is as an intermedial maker, which essentially means I like mixing things together. So images, sounds, videos, texts, objects. And usually that mixing results in quite a variety of different forms. So sometimes it's audio, audio visual performance or installation. 
sometimes fixed media pieces and workshops and also of course sound walks so I'm quite new to making sound walks um, but I really love it as a practice uh, there's something about I think the mix of creative and research elements with also field work and then technical and logistical considerations that seems to be a real sweet spot for me and I find sound walks to be a real joy to make so the piece that I received an honourable mention for um, is called Walking in the Wild Smart City. Um, this is a geolocated sound walk, which was created using the Echoes application. So um, it guides participants through the centre of Manchester in the UK, and it prompts them to engage with the hidden surveillance and smart city technology that's proliferating in the city without us really realising that it's there. Um, and I also created this, um, I suppose it's like a presentation that's using the application Sway. And this was to outline the research undertaken through the walk um, and actually another walk that I created alongside, which was uh, a wild nature trail. Um, so both of them are you, like linked together through exploring theories of wildness through um, certain types of hidden and uh, proliferating kinds of processes and infrastructures. Um, and in lots of ways, when I was making the smart city walk, I really came up uh, across a big challenge, which I didn't have in the wild nature trail. And that was, um, how do you guide people on a walk to reveal technologies that you effectively cannot see and whose workings are, I would argue, quite deliberately hidden? And how can you open up something um, when you don't know whether it's there and you certainly don't really know what it's doing? So as part of the project, I looked at quite a lot of different theoretical underpinnings. So I've mentioned this notion of wildness that was there. The ecological theory and frameworks kind of fed into the nature warp. And then um, I also looked quite a lot at smart technology and critical technology studies. Um, and these are like sets of ideas, I suppose, from theorists who are broadly critical of smart city and surveillance technology. Um, on the basis of um, concerns about privacy, data harvesting, and the type of control that big tech can enact um, on physical spaces through smart city technologies. Um, and I was particularly taken by um, Nigel Thrift's notion that a smart city, because it has sensors and data gathering capacities embedded into its built environment, becomes sentient. Um, essentially, it, it's it starts to gain the ability to feel and to respond to those feelings because it is um, has these sensors which are taking in the information and then it's responding to that information. And Thrift also talks about data spirits or sprites um, as a kind of playful way, I suppose, of conceiving of smart city processes which are happening around us. And so I responded to this through mixing some of the information that I found out about smart city technology in Manchester with more uh, playful evocations of that technology as dancing digital spirits that were chasing in front of us and that we were trying to follow along the walk. Um, as well as some invitations for participants on the walk to try and playfully resist and subvert some of the um, intentions or wishes of the smart city as, as I saw them. Uh, sonically, the walk um, mixes together uh, a few different kinds of sounds. So I did some binaural spoken word recording of my voice um, in, in a few different forms. I used some digital or more synthetic sounds also using um, the Apple program Logic. So drawing actually on their digital library of sounds and creating like a sonic palette to go with the walk. Um, I did a few bits of field recording that was mainly for the nature walk and not as much for the smart city walk. And then a significant element of my practice that um, became quite important in this walk was creating these kind of mini sung vocal refrains. Um, and I'm particularly interested or was interested in this walk in using song um, as these kind of refrains that are like incantations to raise the digital spirits that are around us that we can't see and then bring them to the notice of the participant moving through the city. So, for example, um, in one of the sections of the walk, when a participant is crossing a busy road, that road, I think, is being monitored by artificial intelligence sensors. Um, 
I don't know that for sure, but as they walk, this sound is triggered. So they start to hear this um, vocal refrain, which I hope you can also hear. trying to do there is is to evoke this idea i suppose of um the sensors calculating sifting sorting us all into patterns of data um, and when i was reflecting on this as part of thinking about what i felt i'd um been exploring through the walk um i talked about the way in which um i used the sound in this particular um uh, refrain uh, so like lots of as you heard meanderings up and down which first of all could feel quite unrelated and fluid but then these they resolve into this singular vocal sound and that happens again so it breaks down and then it resolves again so i wanted to evoke how different threads of data were being gathered and then resolved um as written here by the algorithm or machine learning structure into a pattern or shape that it would then respond to so the participant um, walks, hears that, and they're prompted uh, within the text of the walk to pass through hordes of wildly energetic digital spirits busily at work around us and on our behalf. They're asked to really try to feel their activity and presence, which was um, particularly important to me in, in this walk. Um, so it, I was asked to say a little bit about how I make walk so I'll do that um, before I finish so um, in terms of making this walk and, and sound walks more generally I tend to read around the topic and engage in field work at the same time so repeatedly walking in the space alongside looking at theoretical and sometimes contextual research and that allows me to build the text while identifying locations at the same time and then I'll form the route for the walk and start to put the text into the places um, that I've found and um, as soon as they're kind of attached to places, I can start to think about the sonic palette and uh, looking at different digital sounds and vocal loops that I work with quite a lot. A big stage for me is when I take a text and then attach it into the echo. So an echo is like a geo-fenced zone that you create and then place the sound within so that it triggers when the participant walks through that geo-fenced zone. So I have to put them in the space to start to test out how that will actually work. Um, and that testing will always lead back to editing and re-recording and remixing and then back out into the space to test again. And it's this iterative process and cyclical process between those elements until the walk works the way I want it to, both technically in terms of how sound is triggered and where it's triggered as people walk, but also dramaturgically in terms of how it flows and the shape and the dynamic of the piece as well. And sound walk wise, I think I'm really interested in, um, in geolocated sound walks, those moments where um, a physical space and your movement through it just aligns and clicks into something that you hear. So they just momentarily become aligned and entangled. It doesn't happen very often. It's quite a difficult thing to achieve, but it's really magical when it when it does. Um, thematically, I, I like working and thinking about more than human life, um, connections with place, how we exist in a changing and damaged world, how we connect with damaged places, and then how the human voice and sung voice can be an instrument or a tool to help explore those ideas. And just to finish what I'm working on now, I've just made a geolocated sound walk for a local park in Salford, and that was exploring paleoecology, so the ecological past of the space and trying to um, peel back those layers, and then also uh, looking at its present uh, through connections with uh, the more than human world in the park. And my next project, I think, or hope, will be a suite of um, works which will explore relationships with places that we're in as those places are irrevocably changing, are being changed by human activity in the warming climate. And I want to look at do that through the lens of what Glenn Albrecht calls solastalgia, which he describes as the grief that you feel for a place that is changing around you, um, as opposed to nostalgia, which is the grief you feel for a place that has been lost to you or in, um, is, is somewhere that you have left. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening.
Thanks, Joe. Could you repeat that for the term again? Not nostalgia, um, but solastalgia. Although a bit in the uh, if I can find the chat. So it's uh, top right. Solastalgia, and that is the grief you feel for the place around you. As it's if it like so, it's about places that are changing. Um, yeah. In a kind of quite, he, he uses it in relation to, initially in relation to places in Australia where there was very um, specific and very quick kind of mining, open cast mining processes happening, I think. So um, he was looking at and reflecting on the communities within those spaces whose uh, lived environment, but the places that they were very familiar with were just drastically and quickly changing around them. And, and he, he talks about that grief that they feel they're staying in the place it's still the same place but obviously the place itself is being changed around them yeah, yeah. i think i feel a lot of uh, solastalgia mm, but then again too. i think everyone <laughs> who's like over 50 uh, feels solastalgia <laughs> yeah probably Things ain't what they used to be <laughs> kind of right it was better when i was young um but that's <laughs> yeah. uh, that's interesting um building on uh, laura's uh question and i'll get to uh, that one specifically but uh, on echoes uh, one of the Perhaps the most popular app at the moment to build sound walks uh, is Echoes. Uh, Echoes is uh, very well in producing or in having people produce work for within the Echoes app itself or um, uh, for Echoes to facilitate uh, creators work by creating like or by fabricating like copies of Echoes uh, that are standalone versions of Echoes, but uh, for a particular client or or a project or interest. Uh, in your experience, uh, uh, have you found that Echoes is a very good fit for your work or were there aspects where you thought like, oh, well, maybe if it would do this, then? Yeah, um, it is a good fit for my work, but I did battle with it. Um, and I battled with it on the level of, I think, what I initially thought it could do, which I then became clear that it couldn't. And that was not necessarily to do with the functionality of the app. It was more to do with exact GPS locating of people within space, which I had not realized was so variable according to the phone you've got, the provider that you were on, um, all sorts of things which affect that. And actually what you have to do, what I had to do was to find like almost kind of tricks of working with the app. So it would trigger in the way that it needed to. And that's to do with how you order the sound. It's to do with the way in which you, um, what kinds of triggering you put in. And sometimes it's actually just a trick in that it feels like it's triggering, but it's not. It's just that I've timed it in a particular way so that it, it comes at the right time. And that just about works. Um, I really enjoy, um, I've only created linear walks so far, so I have only created walks where you move from one geolocated zone to the other and the sound um, triggers as you walk. Um, I have uh, experienced quite a lot of work on Echoes that does really beautiful synced development of sound that is a lot more circular and is not as linear in its form. Um, and I think that's probably where the beauty of the app is in lots of ways, because I think the syncing of certain types of rhythm and melody that then builds up and shifts and recedes as you move through space seems to me to be one of its really um, brilliant elements. I tried doing very specific three dimensional um, sound within echoes, which is something that um, I think you can do. But again, I really struggled with that. So that should be that if I place the sound on a, let's say, a, um, you know, a surveillance camera, that when you move around the camera, it feels like you're moving around the sound yeah. as well. Um, I just couldn't make that work at all. It was not specific and precise enough in terms of the um, GPS or how I was using it or my phone or whatever it might have been. So, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy the use of the app. I think it's very usable. I think it's really clear. I think um, it's very accessible. Well, I certainly found it and I'm not somebody who's particularly techie. Um, but there were definitely, I found like limitations, I suppose, um, which could be to do with my technology or could be to do with the way I'm interacting with it. Yeah, yeah there's of course uh, the challenge that uh, even if something works on your device, it might not yeah. work on millions of people's devices, right? Because That's you exactly can't right. Yeah. control what they, what the, the actual hardware is that uh, they use, mm -hmm. or how well they are able to receive indeed the, the signal. One way in which everyone can see this for themselves, if you use uh, um, um, uh, routing software on your phone, like a, a Google mm -hmm. Maps or something, 
uh, and uh, you're following the route that Google Maps tells you, and then you choose to follow another route for the first yeah, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds sometimes, it will pretend that you are on the route that Google Maps told you to be on, even yeah. though the GPS should tell it that you're not, but it claims that you are. Uh, so it also uses tricks to make you think that it's more accurate, but it's not. And that is fine for Google Maps, but if you rely on the user's position to uh, create an experience, then this is problematic because you can't predict mm -hmm. where they are if they if you have no idea where they're going, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another question, uh, a bit more on uh, the conceptual part of your work. Uh, for for how I see uh, a lot of the things that you describe, is uh, that the smart city is really an extension of. Um, uh, the situationist concept of how public space controls the uh, individuals that move within this public space. Uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, situationist thought, but are, are you able to say a little bit about this perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's obvious parallels between that. And I think that part of what I suppose my walk was trying to do in, in that kind of key de Boer kind of way was to resist some of that and to, um, prompt uh, somebody to to look at the way in which they walk um, as an act of resistance to the way in which they are being both surveilled and controlled. I think also, though, um, that it became particularly apparent, uh, the political element of it and the, the public space element of it, that I think the situationists were also interested in in terms of control when um, the, the walk entered into a POPs, which is the, this uh, privately owned public space in Manchester, of which there are so many, and, and I think across cities um, in the UK, certainly, and perhaps in, across the world. And I find these spaces particularly insidious in terms of the way in which they seem to, to present as public space that you could you know, freely be in, but actually are spaces which um, you are only allowed to be in through the grace and favour of the person who happens to uh, actually be owning that space. And I think that just affects so much much when you know that and when you start to engage with that in terms of public spaces and cities and realize that they're all being bought up and being transformed in that way then I think that kind of um, you know uh, approach for the situation is to, to resist control of public space in that way starts to become particularly sharp and particularly apparent and I think smart city controls in those spaces are particularly heightened so you will see a lot more cameras you'll see a lot more surveillance technology and you'll see a lot more um, physical security within those spaces as well and so they feel like spaces where you would um, be looked at a lot and your, your behavior would be uh, judged um, a lot more than when you're in you know spaces in the city which don't have that kind of uh, quality to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but actually, I would go uh, further than that uh, in, in exactly the way as what you identify in uh, your piece, in that what you're now describing with more cameras or more uh, surveillance that we can see, this is very much in line with how uh, the situationists saw the manipulation of public yes. of the individual in public space. Mm -hmm. you, if you can identify this manipulation, then you can push back against it, right? So if you see that you are being surveilled, then you can do something to 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 prevent this surveillance or to leave the surveilled area. Uh, mm -hmm. But if surveillance happens in a way that we cannot perceive, mm -hmm. then you you don't even know that you are being manipulated. You you can't you can't even know that you're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. So fighting back uh, against something that you don't. Sorry, who was that? No, no, no. Was, sorry, no, was, yeah. I I, um, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that um, one of the really difficult things um, to do with giving consent, you know, to being surveilled and your data being collected, and we don't know what happens to it. You know, there are all sorts of ways in which smart city um, operations are obscured and obfuscated from us. Um, you know, I've looked very closely at what the council says about it. I've looked at what the private companies who put these technologies into space to say about them in Manchester, and, and they don't really say anything because they don't want you to know, in, in, in my opinion. And then um, I think it's Vincent Moscow uh, talks about the fact that when you put these technologies into public spaces, nobody can click the consent, even though when we consent to cookies on our browser, we kind of, you know, that's not really properly consenting either because we don't really fully, you know, it's not giving us the full information about what they're doing. And we just kind of going, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's even worse when you're walking down the street, you didn't click anything to consent to um, your face, you know, facial recognition technologies and those kind of things that are coming in. 
and particularly those kinds of very hidden sensors that are gathering other types of data as well. So I agree with you. I think it is, you know, it's it has gone beyond that particular conception and into something else. And obviously, when you start to bring um, artificial intelligence into that, then and you're entering into other realms still uh, in terms of how those sensors operate and uh, the types of kind of um, learning and judgments that are happening um, without direct human control, even, you know, so. Yeah, it's exactly. kind, of, kind of scary. <laughs> and, and then what we actually arrive at is the question I asked Tony earlier about uh, whether he believes society is degradating uh, or is, <laughs> is deteriorating or, or not. Uh, and, and so, well, thanks, Joe. Uh, uh, Andrew, I'm going to push your question to after the presentations. Because, um, uh, I, I forced Joe to keep on talking in this uh, particular section. Uh, and so then we arrive at Laura, um, and then I am sharing my screen as Laura requested. I am going to do that. Just to say, uh, if anyone has headphones, I'm going to play a little bit of audio that will probably sound a little bit better if you have them. Yes, and then... First, this. Oh. oh, there is. Something like this. Laura. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for sort of creating this curatorial platform and space for listening to sort of wonderful, wonderful creators talk about their work, you know? I don't think there's anywhere else where, yeah, located media of the kind we're making is shared or shareable, so thank you. Um, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be a bit personal in my introduction to uh, Are You a Ghost Hunter? An audio trail of the old church because it doesn't really feature my voice. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what the place means to me. So, uh, I found myself wandering around graveyards quite a lot as a form of therapy back in 2021. And I'd go out day and night, um, sometimes, with a, sometimes with a Zoom recorder, sometimes with a handful of cashew nuts. And St. Mary's old churchyard the oldest and the best that I found in London. And for some reason that I don't really know and I don't want to know, after I'd spent a couple of hours in there, kind of peering at the gravestones and scaring all the rabbits and foxes out of the long grass and thinking about my own death, I'd get really cheerful, you know, and my spirits would lift. And it was, it was kind of surprising to meet uh, this group of teenagers in the graveyard because St Mary's is quite a quiet and secretive kind of place. It's not really as glamorous as Highgate or Abney Park and it doesn't get many visitors. But there was this group of teenagers in there and they were just chilling after school, maybe smoking a couple of spliffs and w warning. Oh, hello. I just got a message. Is that all right? Sorry, that was me. Just... Oh, right. oh, cool. Okay, sorry. <laughs> warning. They were sort of teenagers are in there warning um, heavy footed ramblers not to trample on, 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 on these kind of graves that were really so old that the teenagers couldn't have any personal connection to the dead. But it was lovely to see them being kind of self appointed guardians, you know, and keeping watch over this space for us, this precious public space. And they uh, they all thought that I was a ghost hunter, you see, because I, I don't know, this Zoom H4 looks a little bit like an EVP machine that ghost hunters off the telly use to capture the, uh, the voices of the paranormal world. And so they call me like ghost hunter or ghostbuster number five. And um, I don't know if I'm a bit of a lightweight or if it was just the kind of uh, the heavy life stuff I was going through, but... I started to feel a bit lightheaded around these teenagers. Um, 
kind of feeling a bit guilty that I was wandering around looking like a ghost hunter and having all this fancy kit but not really doing anything for the dead. Um, the teenagers are doing their bit and I felt like I needed to do something for this kind of otherworldly place that was helping me make sense of this world, my world. And yeah, so I was thinking, well, audio, what does audio offer? I guess, like, like, um, like Babak said, the inscriptions on a lot of the graves have been kind of completely eroded by weather and time. So you don't know who's buried there. Um, and what you don't want is a kind of the sort of heritage treatment to be given to St. Mary's, you know, a tea shop and heritage plaques and all of that kind of stuff. Um, or sort of restoration work that attempts to fix the graveyard back at some point in the 19th century. So audio kind of offered a way to like unlock some of the underground and past tense stories, but have that past tense punctured by the present tense energy and humour of the, the young people that were using the space. Um, and yeah, they get the first and last word and they give the piece its title. So I just wanted to play a little bit of it, if that's all right, um, from the website that Babak's got, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that worked, right? Oh no, it did. It just needs to go or, back to the beginning, I think. Yeah. Oh, I got uh, unintelligible audio. Okay, we try again. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's unintelligible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, but I've got your file. This is well, you know, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, but there is well, okay, fingers crossed. Oh, it's been very scrambled. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, what? Well, well, I don't think it's okay. Uh, hold on, let me try uh, something quick because it's uh, it might not work, but we can we can only we can hope. Uh, No. How about this? No. Ah, that's uh, very annoying. Okay, we can, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to share the screen once more, but otherwise I will just share the link mm -hmm. uh, instead, and then you can listen to it for a few minutes for yourself. Ooh. Okay, we try. Oh boy, oh boy. This is why we do technology uh, trials, right? Uh, three weeks uh, before uh, actually the presentation. But what you we want didn't me test was to whether. Try. I mean, yeah, that would be nice works. because you shared yeah, your yeah. screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you need the URL? No, I've, I've, I've got it, I think. Um... Yeah. So, uh... Uh... I think it. I think that's the, uh, the the essay. Let me just put the link in the chat. Sorry, I'm being really useless. The old church. Oh. Okay, I got it. But we lost your screen share now. Yeah. Oh wait a minute though, because yeah. I've got to press the press the magic button. Yes. Let's share it. Yes. <laughs> Okay, let's see. This works. Excuse me. Are you ghost hunting? She is a new. I keep ghost hunting. Yes, I keep finding you. They're definitely ghost hunting. Why aren't Are you a ghost hunter? An audio trail of the old church. You got your headphones ready? Are you listening? There's a mysterious archway with a lantern at the entrance to the old church. 
We're meeting someone, the poet, Jean Spracklin. Returning to the old churchyard, it's a bit like listening to a favourite piece of music and hearing it a little differently each time. I'm standing beside the archway with the lantern. I'm looking up at the curly ironwork and I'm walking through the arch. Ready? Let's walk until we reach the heavy wooden door. It's hella old. The stone above the door says 1563. St Mary's is the only surviving Elizabethan church in London. The church is now used as a centre for the littiest parties, arts and events. Let's put our ear to the door. Sam Lee is singing inside. spiritual from a freed slave um, sung by an oarsman who was carrying people across the water and he sang this song that is about passing over to the other side as though he was the oarsman on the Akron taking the dead souls to, to the underworld and that chimes in with the story of this place when it was also in a point of decay. In the 19th century there was water underneath the floor of the church where we're standing now and coffins were floating on the deep flood water like lost boats as though they themselves were also being taken to the other side oh graveyard oh graveyard lay this body down so it's kind of incredible that uh, we think we're in a very solid stable place but actually everything's moving here and shifting and trying to be taken down. The earth is trying to consume and swallow everything. Let's turn our backs on the door. We're following the wooden path that forks off to the right, keeping the church building on our right hand side. Stop walking before you reach the open air theatre at the back of the church. I think of this place as a, a kind of time machine. You know, we're in the middle of a, a very busy part of North London. But here we are in a village churchyard. That's what it is. And the tombs and memorials around us are often family tombs with generations of that same family buried there. So there's a real sense of continuity and of a kind of stability of, of belonging here, just as you would get in a, in a small village. A misty looking village, as Edgar Allan Poe said. Edgar Allan Poe came to this church every Sunday back in the day. He always remembered the sound of the bells. The deep hollow note of the church bell breaking each hour the stillness of the day. You will see a faint path that runs past the marble cross. Let's follow Edgar Allan Poe along that ghostly path into the very back of the churchyard. Stop when you reach the oak tree, stretching its branches over the tombs. Edgar Allan Poe, he wrote a famous story about a young rascal who meets his double here. An imitation of myself, noticed by myself alone. The name of the double, William Wilson, was lifted from one of the old tombs. Wilson looks like my man moves like him, talks like him. His, His voice, voice, it became the very echo of my own. 
My man gets a taste for gambling and hustling and con man business. Every time he's about to finesse someone, Wilson appears as the voice of reason and warning. Freeze when you hear a whisper in the oak tree. What say you conscience grim, that spectre in my path? Vexed by his haunting double, my man draws a sword and he challenges Wilson to a deadly duel. The double takes his last breath beneath the evergreen oak tree. In me didst thou exist, and in my death how truly thou hast murdered thyself. Let's keep walking past the oak tree. The church is on our right hand side. For England is a heart of gold. It's England, Ireland, and Scotland. And then unity shall never be broke. We're coming around to the northeastern corner of the church. Just before you reach the gate, there's a large box tomb with pillars on each corner. It's just to the left of the path and it's very overgrown. You might just be able to make out a wonderful inscription. Stranger, Stranger whoever thou, thou art, that, thou art, visiteth, that these visiteth these silent mansions of the dead. Here, pause. That's a very Sorry. good place to pause it. <laughs> Yeah, so just to say at the end that you've heard kind of Edgar Allan Poe's story of William Wilson. There's a story of Conscience Grimm and it's kind of that bit of the, the walk was co-produced with the narrator Benner who's really skilled at switching between a kind of modern register and Poe's formal language to express that idea of consciousness haunted by conscience. And then at the very end, you meet other people of conscience that were actually buried in the graveyard, social reformers, abolitionists. And one thing I found really interesting about very old tombs, like, you know, 17th, 16th century, sort of 16th to 18th century maybe, is that they don't use their epitaph to, to, to boast of their good deeds. They use that space on the stone almost like a public safety announcement, you know? Stranger, whoe'er thou art, that visited these silent mansions of the dead, here pause, you know, remember the frailty of this earthly bliss that you seek, or don't stand too close to the fire, otherwise your clothes will catch light, like Elizabeth Pickett. And you know, for all of us that are kind of thinking about how we'll be remembered or whether to pass on our DNA, I guess there's just this nice thing of maybe you don't have to worry about that. You can just put on just a nice public service announcement is all you need to leave to the world, really. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's a, a wonderful piece. Uh, one thing that immediately springs to mind is a, um, a technical uh, issue. You chose to make uh, the piece very linear. It's one audio file. Uh, but uh, you address uh, in the piece individual locations in and around the church. Uh, so some of us, maybe Joe, <laughs> would pick echoes and instead and create individual uh, audio files that are geolocated. Now, did you purposefully not do this or did you feel that this was just a natural choice for, for this piece to make it a linear piece? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I wanted to make it as easy as possible for people. You know, they just need to find a little QR code outside the church and just kind of drift rather than worrying about where they are. Um, I figured that the audience might not use apps that much. Um, and also I quite like having kind of continuous sound layers, you know, that one, one segment of the piece then drifts into another. 
through, you know, binaural field recordings or snatches of folk song. Yeah, yeah, and Robin is correct. It's a very small space, and then if the uh, the, the accuracy of the uh, uh, GPS is not very good, then you mm -hmm. totally lose the ability to steer the user into a particular experience. This is very true. Uh, although at the same time, I think Echoes also allows for this, but it's not the only app that does this, uh, is uh, that you can have multiple pieces play at the same time and then also create this layering, which mm -hmm. is then also always different, uh, which might be uh, also interesting. But I'll get to a, a similar question related to that a little bit later. Um, now, also, you said at the start that you have a, a bit of a soft spot for graveyards. Yeah. <laughs> I think you didn't say soft spot, but that's my uh, 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 interpretation. Now, um, uh, are there particular graveyards that are maybe not? Uh, I mean, if you say Père Lachaise, then I will we'll say, yeah, of course. But are there graveyards that you are familiar with that you have encountered over the years that were that particularly stood out uh, besides this one and besides maybe Père Lachaise? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I do, having been a bit rude about Victorian garden cemeteries, I am fond of Brompton, but I quite like it because it's a kind of, it's also a legendary kind of cruising zone. So you've got kind of sex and death alongside one another. And it's quite interesting how those spaces provide sanctuaries for different sort of countercultural groups through the ages, you know? I guess like graveyards in the city, they're like the only place that is open all night, doesn't get locked like a park, and you don't have to pay an entrance fee. And for that reason, they're not just sanctuaries for wildlife, they're sanctuaries for people maybe. Um, and you know, if you're a woman alone at night in a graveyard, you're more likely to cause fright than be frightened. And so it's quite a good cover to just sort of <laughs> wander around with your ghost box, you know? You can use it to your advantage, uh, just wear yeah, a pointy head. Uh, exactly. And, uh, a, small, a small lightsaber. Exactly. That's an interesting point, but they are indeed a kind of public space uh, and not in the way uh, that they are public private spaces, uh, which Joe called POPs. I had not heard that acronym before. Um, but yeah, that's indeed, uh, that's true. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and thanks, thanks to all of you uh, for these wonderful pieces and really these wonderful um, uh, presentations of your work. Um, now, as you all know, uh, it's September and as you all have seen, we are not very active this year with organizing events during September, but we are uh, uh, putting extra effort in Soundwalk September Awards 2023. So I'm hoping that uh, the four of you uh, have or are submitting, have submitted or are submitting uh, new work for this year's awards. And even if you're not submitting for, and this goes for everyone, of course, even if you're not submitting uh, uh, something that, even if you haven't worked on something that's a sound walk, we also introduced a new walking, a new award for walking art that is not uh, sound walking. Uh, so that's broader, but excludes sound walking which still is uh, awarded through the Sunwalk September Award. But now we also have the Mar Charto Award. Uh, so I hope that you are submitting your work if you haven't already done so. Now, um, anyone who has a question, uh, just uh, you know, put, well, throw it out there or put it in the chat. And I think uh, there were, uh, there was one, two points really that Andrew made in the chat. Uh, one was in relation to uh, the GPS museum. And another one was um, uh, by a piece of drama. Do you want to say something about this, Andrew, perhaps, about these two things? Andrew is finding his unmute button, which is in the top middle of his screen. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, actually. Um, well, but here you are. Um, now I've realised I put a little note in about Alistair Horn, an audio drama in Brompton Cemetery. Uh, he, he actually spells his name A L A S T A I R. So he's Alistair Horn, um, and he did it with the British Library as a PhD. He was doing. I can't remember exactly what happens in the drama, but anyway, there is a drama that takes place in Brompton Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably one of many, actually. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what I, where I am or what I'm trying to say, but 
Um, I think the cemeteries are places that people often, um, you know, uh, gravitate towards in more ways than one. Um, and, um, and they're not public. Uh, you've got to remember most of them are actually private in this country. Um, but some of them are public. Um, but, um, and they're often sites of antisocial behavior. Uh, and, and what often happens is that local authorities will, uh, actually put in surveillance equipment to try to, uh, uh, to stop, uh, um, uh, the antisocial behavior. And I think one of the best stories around, uh, cemeteries, it wasn't geolocated, but, uh, it was an audio trail created by Simon Bannister. Uh, who worked in community safety for for the local authority in Brighton, the Brighton City Council, and um, he he renamed himself Morty Queria. Um, <laughs> so if you look up Morty Queria in Brighton, you'll find uh, it's about five or six years ago. He created various um, uh, audio trails um, and stories about the various people <clears throat> who were interred there. Um, to make it an interesting place for people to go to. And therefore, the sheer numbers of people who went there sort of put the antisocial behavior um, in a, you know, uh, in a cocktail or whatever you want to call it. Uh, one of the things they did, which was really brilliant, they had a, a telephone box outside, um, you know, one of those red telephone boxes. You could go into the telephone box and you could dial up people who were buried. Um, and, um, uh, and, and listen on the phone to their stories. Um, so there are lots of things that took place. I think it's called St. Nicholas's church, um, in, um, in Brighton, which is sort of kind of like an insulate, a sound installation rather than a walk. Um, but it was a, a, a really nice thing to do. And I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure that was the question you asked me, Babak, but um, I was mischievous. No, well, did, did, no, no. Uh, my question had two parts, and this was the second part, or not my oh. question, my remark. And the first part was uh, about your uh, uh, comment on the GPS museum. Maybe you want to say something. Oh, oh only, only I was just going to say, uh, Joe, when you were talking about um, some of the things, I just thought of Hello Lampos, which of course was a great uh, project in Bristol, uh, in which they, uh, uh, you know, um, GPS located media where post boxes and lampposts talk to you um, as you went past them. I know it was quite a long time ago now, 10 or 15 years ago. But GPS Museum is run by Fred Adamson, um, who who we know quite, quite well because we, um, his colleague on many things is Herb Vermeer, who's our colleague at Waters and Crate. So, uh, um, but it's worth having a look at because it's quite fun. Um, but actually in 2013, I, I ran a series of walks across London, which was called the expedition into the digital unknown. And we kind of looked at everything you could do on your smartphone, but also everything your smartphone was telling the people around you about yourself. And that was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and even then it was pretty frightening. So I can imagine the smart, the smart city has, has overtaken us big time. Certainly all my neighbors have these doorbells that uh, have video cameras on mm. them, um, which allows them to uh, work from home from the garden shed, which is where I usually work from. But I don't have a video camera on my doorbell, so I can't see who's coming to the door. But uh, it's remarkable how... Um, um, how, how blasé uh, my neighbours are about putting up cameras and um, and then um, making terrible assumptions about passers-by. So, yeah, it's too, too frightening to think that we might have people in authority making decisions about us. I think a lot of those yeah. cameras as well, like, are uh, unsecured and there's loads of them that people can access. So, like, the people have set up cameras in their houses to monitor their pets which, you know, if you know the right way to do it, you can see as well. And, and I think that's the other thing when those kinds of technologies, which is, you know, I, I love the democratization of technology, but there's also other sides to it as well, where things can kind of be proliferated in ways that you wouldn't want to. Yeah, and talk about uh, the uh, terms and conditions that we all agree to for most of these uh, doorbell cameras, the producer, in the US, often it's Ring, I don't know who the leading manufacturer is, 
in the UK and in, in the US Ring is owned by Amazon. Uh, Amazon gets access to all these videos, so uh, they can use it to uh, well to train their systems or to just see what you're doing. It's uh, extremely disturbing. Um, which brings me to a general question uh, for uh, speakers, but also for the audience, uh, because at least a few of uh, the audience are creators themselves. Um, all the four pieces that we saw discussed uh, today uh, are really about psychogeography. They are uh, about how places make uh, people feel, make the the, uh, well, the creators or the, the protagonists, in Tony's case, feel about the places around them. Uh, and they and they respond to this, but uh, does, has anyone worked with uh, worked on projects that visualize what um, how places change around them through signals that are being sent by the environment? So I could imagine uh, uh, wireless signals that are being sent uh, by. Uh, um, pieces of technology in the public space, uh, or maybe uh, cameras that leave uh, uh, particular traces in uh, the audible or inaudible spectrum. Um, has anyone worked with something like this? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, Joe, you, you did a lit. Ah, go, Laura. Does, does... Would you say that LIDAR scanning would count? Manipulate data in a particular... Because I've done a piece where I kind of almost like repurposed an, a dental scanner that they used... To, that dentists used to scan teeth and used it to kind of scan a building that was about to be sold off for luxury flats. And the, the yeah, the dental technicians that work there were going to be made redundant. And that had a sort of... I guess that had a psychogeographical quality because you can then sort of peer into this lost building, like into a doll's house, see all the kind of. This sounds related to the piece you won uh, Soundbox September Awards. That's in it. Yeah, the, tex the texture of air. Yeah, but there was yeah, a kind yeah, of, of there was there was a kind of sculpture that went with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw images of that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also, um, I'm aware of one app, uh, which is made by Finns, I believe, people from Finland. It's called Holom, and that, that uh, reacts or creates audio based on uh, all the measurements that your device or devices are able to make. Uh, so you've got all these sensors in your phone, for example, and they sense many things, and you can change what they sense by moving the phone around, for example. And then you can use that to create audio or as inputs for creating audio. Uh, yeah, I, think I haven't that's, seen. Uh... I was going to say that I oh. think I'm not not in my own work, but I think um, there's really interesting work in data sonification and data visualization. So it's that whole kind of set of practices, which is to do with making art from streams of data, but also making them more visible and more present to us. Um, and I think there's some really great work in there, and I've seen some really interesting. I suppose more political kind of um, iterations of that kind of work where, and it is, and it, and it is trying to grasp something, but it's also, you know, working with it in, in creative ways too. So yeah, what you were talking about, that made me think about that. Mm. Yeah. Now there's also, I'm sure everyone is aware, or at least on the periphery, that Apple is about to release, or beginning of next year, or somewhere next year, uh, the Apple Vision Pro which are the 3D or the goggles that you're supposed to wear uh, and through that uh, can consume augmented reality, uh, digital recreation superimposed on uh, what you see around you. And there is speculation that they will also allow you to see, um, uh, for example, Bluetooth signals in the space around you. Uh, I mean, this is pure speculation, right? But uh, I can imagine that uh, you can see a 3D uh, density grid or something. Uh, oh, I believe my video will stop working. Uh, 3D density grids of the space around you uh, to to get an understanding of how dense um, the signaling is in the space around us. Oh. All right. Can I entice anyone else to uh, 
uh, ask a question from our speakers. <laughs> Andrew, you want to ask a question? Andrew Hunt. Yeah, I'm not a speaker, though. Am I still allowed? Oh, absolutely, you're allowed. Now you are a speaker. Okay. See how, how fast Thank that you. goes? It's just an, an observation and perhaps a question at the end. But one of the things is, is uh, themes between Laura and Tony's presentation is the idea of doubling, which has obviously got a Freudian context of the idea of um, Heimlich on Heimlich, I guess. Um, the idea of um, the uncanny as well, coming from Freud and, and doubling. So um, I think. I mean, this this has gone unsaid, but the use of the caretaker, I think the caretaker based his name on Jack Torrance's role in The Shining. Uh, and of course, Jack Torrance is all. And then you've got the Poe horrific kind of uh, sense of doubling. Um, and it just made me think of the fact that Freud talks about this idea of memory only existing in there, of course, right? Uh, it's the only place where in reality uh, things continue to exist because our bodies change irrevocably, the world changes irrevocably, but we remember it in here. So I just thought that's just something I noticed and, and that was interesting in terms of um, film and literature and psychoanalysis. But also my question is that there seems a kind of enlightenment coming through to the present day idea of social good of art so everything in in all of the presentations was about the good of society and a kind of enlightenment kantian thing is there anything more dark especially in tony's um project because the idea of like um doing something a bit more sinister or uncanny there rather than um something that's the societal good is there something there that's just a bit unusually sinister yeah or definitely uncanny? definitely um especially with the burling the app like the location of it i can talk about like alistair crowley um who actually went there and um i think he cursed a part of burling gap i think it was the devil's chimney it was renamed the devil's chimney after after he he cursed it and he said when when, when it collapses um, there's going to be a massive curse and everyone who goes there will be affected um, by this. And since then, a lot of people have been trying to go there. Like, I think uh, Wiccan people try to reverse the curse, try to bless the place after he went there. But I think there's an idea of a sense of eeriness about the place anyway, um, as, a, as a site of suicide. People go there to you know, commit suicide and things like that. But um, yeah, it, it's very, it's a very eerie place. And it, you, when you go there, you actually, you actually feel it. Like when you go to the edge, look, look around and you just, the, the wind's blowing around your ears and it's, it's very strange. So, um, yeah. Brilliant. Can I, can I ask you the same thing, Laura? What, anything that's just bit, wrong? Yeah. Slightly Mary's. dark or negative, yeah, rather than kind of like um, a force yeah. for the good and, and um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of dark histories in St Mary's. I mean, I would sort of, I would say that the double idea in Poe might have more to do with Dubois than Freud. You know, that sense of double consciousness. And, you know, Poe has got a bit of a tortured legacy and is you know sometimes seen to be a, a a writer that kind of um i mean people are torn about whether he was a racist writer or a writer that reflected the racism of his time but people have definitely looked at william wilson that story as a kind of allegory of european american conscience mercantile conscience which is kind of underpinned by transatlantic slavery um, and you know you will find in some of the folk songs that are sung in St Mary's you know those are songs that are not necessarily English songs they've come from elsewhere they come from the Black Atlantic or from Irish gypsies um, and interestingly on the darkness so I don't know if any of you guys saw Jordan Peele's film 
recently, he did a doppelganger film that was kind of, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Was it no. called Us? Us? Oh, us? Shit, that's it, yeah. yeah, Us. Yeah. And that was also, that was Jordan Peele's take on the William Wilson story, you know? And he really made it explicitly a story that was rooted in kind of black America. Um, so, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a nod to that. Okay, thanks. That was, yeah, thanks for that. That was great. Yeah, I think uh, Robin says something that the it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that the caretaker track is from the film about W.G. Sebald. Um, very ghostly and unsettling. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it, it mirrors the landscape perfectly. And I feel like not to toot my own horn, but I just felt like once that thing was once the brief was given to me, I just instantly thought caretaker. I instantly thought of that. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, not much. So, yeah, Seagull's got a really that. interesting. Um, I mean, the whole he for his his own PhD. I remember reading that uh, <clears throat> he wasn't method methodological at all he, in a traditional sense. He was like walking to old churches in in East Anglia, getting you know discovering pamphlets, anecdotal stuff, um, and re writing it into. I mean, that whole process is is quite interesting and fits all of the all of the work here. I think you know the whole. Yeah. Whole, like you know, found, the whole found sounds, kind of hodgepodge things, putting together collages, kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's great. All right, thanks everyone. I think I'm gonna with uh, Robin's uh, uh, uplifting uh, chat messages. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but the chat is not recorded in the video, so uh, I'll uh, read that one comment that uh, made me chuckle a little bit, which is where Robin says uh, that I remember someone once describing his work as writing as if he were already dead. Well, those are uplifting words to end this wonderful meeting of us all with. Uh, th thank you again. Uh, I think it was uh, wonderful. Uh, it's very gr it was really good to hear from uh, uh, the speakers and their work uh, and their ideas and also thanks for your questions um, and I hope to uh, see more of all your work very soon uh, if not uh, submissions to Soundwalk September or Marsharto then uh, uh, whatever um, you end up working on next. Uh, we have as our next event, now I'm failing, uh, I'm not sure. We have an event in October, um, but we also facilitate or participate in an event at the end of September on the 29th, which is exploring public space in a way that uh, um, should allow you to explore yourself. It's about uh, learning more about yourself. Uh, and you actually are supposed to go for a walk during uh, this, this this event, of which I host one. It's called the Worldwide Wonder um, uh, on the September 29th, and I host one that's here in Sao Paulo. Uh, but the whole event lasts 12 hours, six se sessions of two hours, um, uh, set in uh, five continents, I think, six cities in five continents. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's where I would love to uh, leave you all, unless somebody wants to uh, uh, throw in a parting word or a final thought. No, okay, then, then that's it. Thank you very much again, and I hope to see you very soon. Take care. Thanks. Thank everyone. you. Thanks so much. Thank Cheers. You. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.